someone who was doing a conference. Well, actually, it was someone I met when I was in Cairo, Egypt, and uh, encouraged me to submit it to the Social Science Research uh, Council that um, was uh, giving a conference on the informal sector in Germany. And I was invited to present my work there. So uh, you just never know. Uh, one thing always leads to another, and then uh, uh, someone who was at the conference uh, you know, we all, it was a small little town and we all knew each other uh, after the, a few days and he contacts me maybe two years later and says, I'm doing a book on women in the informal sector, you know, in the Middle East and would you like to submit your, your article? And so, well, who, who's going to say no to that? Uh, so, <laughs> you see, again, another contact, networking, uh, this is how things, uh, in, in, you know, unfold. But as um, Egypt, back to Egypt, as an Islamic moderate country, politically, rural, rural women have not been made to wear uh, the shoulder, which is the face covering, but they do dress in black when they do cover their heads. But this is mostly practiced by peasant uh, fellaheen, uh, the peasant class. The middle and upper class generally do not follow this practice. But since the brotherhood has changed, uh, you know, the political situation and it has become much more um, conservative, uh, this has probably changed and I haven't been. So uh, I did, you know, in the media you do see more women covered. but. Mostly the faces and everything, that covering is taking place in Afghanistan or Iran. Um, Egypt still tends to be uh, moderate, um, but they are becoming more conservative depending on, you know, wh who's in power politically, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, in this particular study of income generation, uh, I was looking at chickens <laughs> laying eggs. <laughs> I always find that to be humorous because uh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, in rural Egypt, when people uh, are making money uh, under the table uh, and they're doing it in their homes, um, this was an innovative strategy because previously the chickens just wander around the village. Nobody knows where they lay the eggs or when or how many, or it's just random. This was a set of tiered cages inside the, the peasants' homes. I mean, you had to apply for a loan and get money to support uh, buying the cages and the chickens and the feed and all of this. This was like one step, well, two or three steps up from the wandering flock variety. So. It was now systematic, it was now organized. It, there was a reliable source of eggs um, and systematic collection and regular marketing that can actually count on a product con contrary, contrary to the previous, you know, kind of one or two here and there kind of system. But how did this impact women's lives? Initially, very little, since men were recognized as the primary custodian for the purpose of the loans. Loans were made to the, the man uh, in the family and also the training. This is what was interesting. Because they got the loans, they also got the training. <laughs> and it was funny because they weren't doing anything with the chickens <laughs> or with taking care of anything or making records or collecting money or selling the eggs and absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, so eventually women ran the operation, they managed the profits, and um, they hid them. They hid the lucrative nature uh, of the activity from the men so that they could control the money. And what's interesting is that the money that, uh, for women's enterprises means better food, clothing, and schooling for children. That's what women's money is used for in developing countries. So it's safe to say that women's economic enterprises increases uh, as they increase, so do women's, uh, or so do children's opportunities. Initially, the improvement may only include boys, uh, but later, as more money is available or it becomes institutionalized, girls will also benefit. 
Um, it's well documented in the women in development literature that as girls' literacy levels increase, there is a correlation with increased democratic social structures and labor force participation rates. In many, many developing countries, women's status improvement is dependent upon these micro-enterprise activities. It tends to be true in the Middle East and also West Africa. As we have heard in the media, the Arab Spring brings to mind the demands for democratic participation in government and education, particularly by young people. Continued political unrest in Egypt is related to Sunni and Shia sects uh, of Islam fighting for dominance, some more radical than others. These young people are increasingly connected to world events via the internet and social media is credited with spurring these revolutionary ideas uh, across the region. But also the importance is that young men and women are increasingly participating in higher education in Muslim countries with the hope of possibly participating in the labor force and in government um, while their leaders uh, pretend that there's a democratic government, there still is no representative form of government. And therefore, college graduates oftentimes do not find real job opportunities. These are the folks that you're seeing on your TV screen when they're talking about throwing, you know, whatever, rocks and whatever they have their hands on. Um, trying to just continue to draw attention to um, the, the form of government uh, while they're trying to move toward a more democratic system. But the repressive government continues under the military. Um, right now, the military is controlling the government. They replace Morsi. Uh, as you know, he's in jail. Uh, Mubarak, he re Morsi replaced Mubarak, who's in jail. Uh, and he replaced Sadat, who was assassinated, uh, and that occurred while I was living there. But I think you get the picture. Uh, one sociologist at AUC, the American University in Cairo, Saad Ibrahim, uh, is known, well known in the sociology community in the United States, and he was jailed for commenting on the government in the 1990s uh, and continued to be under suspicion under Mubarak. And there were many people here who helped uh, Help, helped him. But according to Isabel Coleman in the payoff of women's rights, the benefits of women's rights in developing countries, especially Muslim countries like Egypt, is that women are critical participants in democratic change and a stable civil life. The education yields high returns because it affects fertility levels, it improves health and nutrition, and general income for the family and the community. It's estimated that closer, closing the gender gap in education can improve the per capita income by an additional percentage point every year. In Egypt, the mid and upper classes participate in education at higher levels than the lower class who remain undocumented in, in the informal sector. Uh, but as democracy increases, even poor girls will be encouraged to go to school. And the Arab Spring across the region has far-reaching effects for girls' education and for the future of democracy. So we have to wait and see what happens. But uh, I'm going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Denise uh, Segura, who is here from UC Santa Barbara. that led to the formation of this particular book, but also to be part of a panel called Ch um, Changing Our Social World. That is a fundamentally, um, it's actually more of a radical perspective than you might have thought when you selected that, okay? <laughs> that was because, a social club. <laughs> yeah, because when you think about changing our social world, that, that's a lot. And, um, and it requires a certain type of commitment, a certain type of, um, of thinking. 
And he, people here on this panel have given you some ideas about some questions that you might want to be thinking about. Because sociology, that's what makes our discipline grow, is just the way people ask questions. And having questions, you know, and, and figuring out ways to answer them. And you may not even answer them because they'll lead to new questions. Is the way knowledge is created and other knowledge is contested. So, you know, the way that these two things interact is, um, is really fundamentally a social enterprise and something that is essential to changing our social world. So now let me start. Um, uh, I had the privilege to work with uh, Patricia Zavea, who is, a so, uh, actually she's an anthropologist at the University of California at Santa Cruz. She and I uh, both went to graduate school at the same time, although she was there a little bit before me, I like to say. And um, so together we had the opportunity to really think through um, uh, what, what, what's, what's really missing in the migration literature. I mean, here we were in the year, I don't know, 2005 or something like that. And, you know, and migration studies, I mean, the big journals, like the International Migration Review, um, you could look at them, and they would not have any articles on women. I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, um, Monica's mentor, Pierrette Hunzek du Soltello, did a review of, of what the International Migration Review did um, in terms, I think it was from the year 2000 to the year 2009, and she found like five uh, articles on women, and she found one special volume on women. And so what this says, actually, is that the discourse on immigration, the research on immigration, the perspectives on immigration were fundamentally male-centered, as if essentially migrants were all men. When if you think about it, that can't possibly be true. So what we thought about was, well, because um, this called us into developing what we call a feminist approach. And this feminist approach um, was really a major paradigm shift. And it, what it does, when, you, when we think about a feminist, in short, in brief, is really placing women at the center of research and teaching in the areas of immigration, Chicano Chicano studies, Latin American studies, global and international studies, sociology, anthropology, all of these particular disciplines. And so to bring women at the center. And um, so that's the perspective. Now, you've been told here that there's a couple of ways to situate questions and work. One is to think about um, how somebody else is wrong, how their theories are wrong. Or else to say like, oh, I love this theory, so I'm going to do more in that field. Both are perfectly legitimate. What we did is we said, OK, there's certain gaps in, in other types of, um, well, how does this thing work? Right, so in other words, there's two major approaches in terms of looking at borderlands migration. And one is in the social sciences, and one is in cultural studies. OK? And um, so if you look at the social science approach, Okay, now you'll notice there's no text there. Um, I think social science really focuses on what we call transnational social formations. We look at globalization. We look at interconnectedness. We, look, we do at the big macro. Okay, you look at the big picture, the economy, the world, globalization, those processes of interconnectedness. But when you, but you, when you bring those interconnectedness processes down, then you look at women in the labor force, si se puede, okay? You look at borderlands issues. You look at the way people are separated across borders. But that's not just a sad picture of separation. That's actually a picture in the New York Times of a protest at the border. And here you have an ethnography, Mexican New York. Mexicans are not just an Oxnard. They're not just in LA. We are everywhere. Okay? And at the rate we reproduce, we're going to be more. Okay? I say that happily because I'm expected to be another grandmother soon. Okay. And um, we look at education. That's not a total self-serving uh, picture. Um, these are two of my wonderful graduate students 
who are now, um, the first one is Lorena Garcia, who is now at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And she just got tenure, she's an associate professor. And uh, she wrote a book on Latina adolescent um, sexuality. Um, the person behind her is Peruana, and that's Silvana Falcón, who is a professor now at the University of California at Santa Cruz in Latin American and Latino Studies, who's working on research on um, Peruvian women, but also global feminism. So this is, and so they started out, you know, I remember they were my students. They were like, you, they were young, and they were like, what are we going to do? I'm like, take a lot of classes. But <laughs> ask a lot of good questions, you know, and work hard, and you will get there. That's the graduation at UC Santa Barbara. Okay. There's cultural studies approaches. Now, cultural studies approaches are kind of interesting. They're a little bit different. It's a branch of social science, I said, uh, we like to think, but it's a little bit different. Where social science is really embedded in the economy, we're looking at, um, we may be looking at the way people adapt in different environments. We will look at how migrants, um, like what Monica's doing, you know, how migrants are working, but how they're also adapting to that labor force, and what these were social relations are between um, indigenous subjects and non-indigenous subjects, okay? We do that kind of work. But now cultural studies is a little different. This is more about identities. And identities, how identity formation is linked to multiple sites, both real and imagined. Because what your perceptions are can often guide your behavior. Um, and we, we talk about hybridization. And we talk about how identities shift and negotiate it. Now this is a really interesting set of pictures here, guided by one of uh, my, my former students who's now at, and I keep on talking like this, I'm thinking, it's not because I'm trying to say, oh, I have all these wonderful, I'm this great mentor, although, whatever. And, um, <laughs> but it's also that I have these great students at the, in the room, just like you. I mean, Socorro Casaniela Miles is now at Santa Clara University. She started off in the community colleges up there, and, you know, and now she's a professor where she got her BA from. So it's kind of awesome. Yeah. And uh, anyway, so she started off here. And here you have a famous, of course, um, imagery within our community, um, especially those of us who, are, who have been raised Catholic. You have Our Lady Guadalupe, La Lina de Guadalupe. And that's the traditional image. But now you have another one where that has been shifted with, as, as, our, as our identities, as our, as our thinking starts changing, as we come to grips of who, that's the traditional femininity world. Like you were talking about traditional masculinities, you have traditional femininities. You know, the good woman, la mujer sufrida. And here you have a woman who is like really demonstrating her sexuality, but it's within the terrain of, yes, I'm still a good woman. It doesn't mean I'm a bad woman because I'm doing this. Um, my grad student did a study, she showed both pictures. She actually she showed up three. And some of the women, because you know, she did different groups um, in San Jose, were like, I hate these pictures. And then she told them the picture of the middle one. This woman was an incest and rape survivor, okay? And she could never, ever show her body when she grew up because she was so ashamed. And so the artist took, you know, it was through a lot of therapy, through a lot of, you know, really real work for her to do this was just reclaiming herself. And it's that reclamation process that, that, that's part of what we call a hybridized, hybridized um, identities. And it's how women claim agency in the border. And these are part of the kind of issues that we are integrating in our feminist approach in this particular book. So we have five sections. One is borderlands at sites of struggle. The other is the topography of violence. The other is flexible accumulation and resistance. What that really means is women at work, <laughs> okay? And the other is family formations and transnational social networks. And the last one is transculturation and identity in daily life. Our key questions are, when you bring women to the center, how does our understanding of gender, family, identity, migration, and mobility change? When women are this, at the center, how does our understanding of our sexualities, oppression, power, and activism change? 
And in what ways do race, class, and gender organize discourse on who is legal? In the first section, for example, we, uh, we look at questions of gender, sexualities, and border monitoring. Who is legal? For example, the first, the first article, well, it's not the first article in the book, but it's one of the articles, and it's called Illegal Status and the Social Citizenship, Thoughts on Mexican Immigrants in a Post-National World. And what she's arguing, Adelaide del Castillo, who is at, I think she's at Cal State San Diego um, in Women's Studies, um, and she's a veterana of the Chicana movement of the 1970s, um, where she did a lot of writing. She's one of the first writers um, on La Malinche and, um, and also looking at Chicana activism in those days. And so she's looking at right now kind of questions of what we call social citizenship. What is that? Okay, so that, there's that, so that the whole construction of legal, who is legal, who is not legal, there's many forms of legality. And some are embedded not just in your nativity, where you're born, but also how you participate, what you bring to a society. So she looks at different forms of citizenship. You have this other article, Looking Like a Lesbian, The Organization of Sexual Monitoring at the U.S.-Mexican Border by Ethne Littlehide, who I believe is at the University of Arizona. I bring you these, those titles in case you're interested in where they're at and you don't want to fork out money for the book, go on Amazon, it's cheaper. But anyway, um, you can just, you know, contact these people. We respond. So it'll take like a week or two, but we'll respond, okay? And Ethne, um, what she found out was that until very recently, like a few years ago, um, if you were suspected of being a lesbian, your sexuality could actually be a way to exclude you from legal status here in the United States, from legal entry, okay? Because it's considered, um, it was considered, I believe, in the 1990s to be, um, it could be some kind of what you call um, uh, the psych psychological deviance, okay? Yeah, so there's a lot here that we need to think about. <laughs> And part of what we're doing is we're looking at alternative ways of, of, of quickie policy questions, like what um, one of my colleagues here discussed was the key policy, policy question of mortality, death, okay, and who lives longer and why, and who dies quicker and why, okay? Now, what we're looking at is questions of reproduction. There's all of these ideas that Latinas come over, you know, it's like they come over, like nine months pregnant, drop the baby here so the baby can get citizenship and, you know, and get the health, health, health claims and so forth, and then whatever. Now, that's part of the whole question. But the whole, this is a construction. The whole construction is intertwined with the immigration debate. And so several articles discuss questions of legal and illegal status and how they're politically constructed and they're not natural, they're not naturally, na they're not actually natural. So women and their bodies, women and their bodies are part of the debate, as several articles show. And gay and lesbian identities have been monitored at the border. And I mean, okay, for example, myth versus reality. Myth, Chicago Latina fertility, fertility is out of control. There's this whole big thing about we're having too many babies. But what does too many babies mean, really? Okay? Who has too many babies? The other one is Mexican women are wedded to childbearing and opposed to contraception. These are the myths. The reality is, Chicana and Latina girls, and this is uh, uh, the source is an article in the book from anthropologist Leo Chavez, who's at the University of California, Irvine, in an article called A Glass Half Empty. Latina reproduction in public discourse. The reality is that the Chicana Latina girls have lower rates of sexual activity than non-Latinas. And with increasing acculturation to US norms, in other words, the longer they're here, they tend to have sex earlier, okay? Instead of less, right? So, and in general, Mexican women's fertility is declining. Now this is a very complicated article, so these are some of the highlights. 
And it just to kind of give you a sense of some of the ways that we're looking at traditional kinds of myths about our population and trying to think, put women at the center and think it through and ask some slightly different questions. One of the big areas has to do with capitalism, patriarchy, and violence, structural violence. <clears throat> One of the question, question areas we look at is homicidio, femicide, the, the killing of women. That is not, um, that has, is probably most famously documented in Ciudad Juarez on the US, Mexico, and Texas border. Now, one of the articles that we um, have here is by Rosalinda Fregoso, who is also at the University of California at Santa Cruz. Um, she wrote this article called Toward a Planetary Civil Society. And um, what she's looking at is how do we understand and explain the killing of women in Ciudad Juarez? But not just there. That's not the only place that women are killed. The state does very little. Um, but also Honduras, but other sites of violence in the world where there's, you know, upheaval, Africa, Russia, wherever. Women's bodies become a site of violence. And she looks at this from, and, and, and theoretically, meaning she's looking at how we can think about it larger conceptually, okay? And so she, what she's theorizing is that we're running, going from negation to disaggregation. Okay, and what negation means, it's a narrative of interpretation or discourse denying that the violence against women is systemic and lays the blame on the victims. La mujer mala, okay? Well, they're getting killed because they were on the streets at night. What were they doing out there? They should have been home, okay? Putting the blame on the women, right? As opposed to why isn't it safe for women to be walking on the streets away as they leave the maquiladora or their site of work or the church or wherever they've been. Why isn't it safe? Why were the police not doing what police are supposed to do, keep people safe, as opposed to being part of the killing structure sanctioned by the state? So this is a, a process of discreditation and really just shifting blame by the state to the actual victims themselves. And so she calls that negation. But she says, but there's another strategy the state uses. Structural violence is very adaptable. And the other one is disaggregation. And this is where you use scientific evidence. Science, so what you say is that, well, there's no evidence to suggest that these violence, that these murders were related, or that somehow women are naturally being um, targeted, or that it's really that our city is unsafe because we're not doing our job. There's no data, okay? So data is good, but data can be misused. So always be very critical. When you read a study, look at it a little bit harder and just think about what they aren't asking. And think about how we come to a question of where women's bodies are accessible to men. Okay? I have a whole lecture actually on structural violence and domestic violence and how they're intertwined. And if you think about it, it starts young. Okay? Now, how many of us wanted to be awakened when we were unconscious by a man? The political economy of risk is another form of structural violence. So when we say structural violence, we're talking about large, um, how society itself is structured in ways that the state allows violence to occur, it allows, it allows poverty to occur, it allows risk behaviors to, um, to flourish. Um, and so what we're talking about here in an article written by my colleague Pat Savea and Sochi Castaneda on uh, the changing constructions of sexuality and risk, migrant Mexican women farm workers in California, what they did is they studied large numbers of women in the fields and men in the fields, and they looked at how women were uniquely posed to be at risk in this particular occupation. 
so that the workplace was organized itself to facilitate what they called the male gaze. Look at that, okay? And look at what your genitals are essentially on display. They're covered, but it doesn't take a huge lot of imagination to uncover them, even read by all, and policed. There's a lot of sexual harassment that's embedded in this occupation. But although, you know, we're talking about this occupation, I also teach this class called Women in Work at UC Santa Barbara. And the whole way that workplaces are organized to facilitate the male gaze and to promote sexual harassment, when it happens at such a large extent, then this is when we start talking about structural, um, you know, structural violence. So, you know, one person getting harassed is not the same thing. When you have, like, large numbers, this is when you start having a, a real major problem. If you look at the maquiladores, which you probably, I don't know, you know the, the big garment factories, the big electronic factories along the border. If you look at how many of them are organized, they're organized in a way where, you know, you're all down there, and the managers are way up here, and, at the, and, at, and essentially most of the workers are women, and so who's looking at whom? Who's monitoring whom? And who gets ahead and why? Okay, so these are some of the questions that are also being asked in other articles in this book, where we consider processes of global production. We look at the global assembly line. We look at women who are in reserve army of labor. And we look at now how care work is being outsourced. Think about it, as I get older, I mean, I'm very fortunate right now. I mean, I'm hopefully temporarily in a wheelchair, and I'm very blessed that my parents are right there. Mom, shout out to mom and dad. <laughs> have taken time out of their lives to um, run a comfortable place in San Francisco where my daughter who's going to San Francisco State lives with them, uh, you know, rent free. Yes, family. <laughs> and, uh, and you gave a shout out to your dad. And, uh, and, um, and I think that, um, you know, and my mom was once talking about the political economy of risk. She remembers back in the day, way back in the day, Back in the day before any of you were here. I shouldn't say that long, but anyway. And these, I mean, she was tripping out because we came here to, here to Oxnard and driving from Santa, uh, from Galita, and she says, wow, this is really different. She says, because when she was young, at the end of, in the, in the 1940s, and she was here, uh, they, she was a farm worker in the summer months, and they would pick um, walnuts because there was a lot of orchards back here back in the day, okay? And she says that one, one time, the, I guess the truant officers did a sweep of the farm workers, right? And caught all, everybody who's supposed to be in school, caught them all, and made them all go to Oakland, uh, I'm sorry, um, Oxnard Union High School, right? And so, where they were stigmatized because if, you, if you've been in the fields, your hands get pretty messed up. And in her case, this color, she went to school with black hands. All the walnut workers did. And so, you, even if you want it, to try to blend in. There was a structure to prevent you from doing so. Just kind of like what you were talking about with the indigenous subjects, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you want to blend in, there's cultural differences, there's all kinds of you know, uh, visual appearances that work against that. This is part of the way, the kinds of questions we would ask when we would look at that. And we would say, what's going on? What are some larger kinds of social processes of negation or of you know, lack of, of some problem that's going on. But it also leads that, you know, not all is doom and gloom in this book. You're thinking, oh my God, I'm depressed, okay? <laughs> so no, we, we don't believe in depression, okay? We believe in empowerment. We believe in looking at, so for us, questions of social citizenship, asserting new identities, and activism are all part of what's also happening simultaneously alongside the, the political economy of risk, even Farm workers are unionizing, janitors are unionizing, all kinds of people are, are asserting for their rights. And so we, and, and it's not just a structural thing, it's a personal thing. So that what happens is that for some of us who may have a different figure, we may have a different sexuality, we may have a different set of who, sense of who we are. And one of the things that she does, it's like the weirdest thing about being Chicana or Latina, is that on one hand, we're, we're seen as like, you know, these, these people that are really good, we go to church, you know, we're really modest. And then this other thing is like, you know, we're all these like, 
you know, tatted up, you know, hybridized, you know, uh, se excessive sexual, you know, available females, you know? So that how, with one of the articles in the book by Debbie um, Paredes, she did this study where she, she talked to a lot of people and she did a huge set of observations uh, a film and so forth. So it's a very kind of interdisciplinary study. And she looked at how body traits have been traditionally undervalued. You know, there's like this range has not just simply existed with value. Certain body traits are valued, others are not. Okay? And Latinas have a lot of, some, some of Latinas, some Latinas have a lot of body traits that have not been traditionally valued. Rita Hayworth and Raquel Welch could only become stars after they disguised themselves. You know they were both Latina, right? Okay. Well, now you know. Um, Selena could be who she was, and as for me, for once, I could be proud of my big bottom, said Jennifer Lopez in one of the interviews. So becoming Selena is one way to override the constraints that often limit Chicana and Latina identity and sexuality. Sort of like, you know, value who you are affirm who you are, you know? No, you don't have to get body fixtures necessarily, okay? Or use the lightning creams or whatever. Um, there's many things that have been done historically because of the possessive investment in whiteness that George Lipsitz, who's one of my colleagues, has written about. And again, like I said, but there's other forms of resistance and empowerment, justice for janitors, uh, a major organization in the state, and was written um, by Cynthia Cranford, another article in, um, in our book. And as we look at resistance and empowerment, again, I go back to um, Ciudad Juarez, because here we have a situation again of where you think, what can these women do? What can these communities do? They took the, they took the Mexican state to the world court, okay? Uh, several of the families, because they got so frustrated with why are not these disappearances and deaths getting investigated. And so they took them to court, and they won. So Mexico is supposed to be uh, um, doing things. And um, what those things are exactly, I have to figure it out, because they're still negotiating that out. And, uh, but in addition to, of course, paying some redress to, to the families, um, they also have to now uh, do a more serious investigation. They're supposed to be doing um, other sorts of, uh, 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 of things to make the environment safer. So there's been an implicit recognition that blaming the victim was a short-sighted <coughs> strategy and it was wrong, that this is a larger issue of structural violence. But what this resistance does, what these mothers have done, they didn't start off as agents of social change. Many of us don't, but it speaks to what feminist theorist Gloria Anzaldúa talks about in terms of a mestiza, consciousness, and a borderlands identity. So many of us, so many of us, feel like we're kind of betwixt and between different social and psychic worlds. Sociologist, um, okay, I just lost her name. She wrote this article on um, liminal legality where people live in this kind of nebulous state, neither legal or illegal, which is where many of our population is. Some of us, when we go into a certain environment where we're the only one, you're the token hire. But I was hired at the University of California in Santa Barbara in sociology. I was the only Latina, the only Mexican, or the only Latina, right? I was the only Chicana woman of Mexican descent in the University of California sociology departments, the 10 departments, until five years ago. Okay? And I was hired, okay, here it comes. I was hired in 1986. Okay? So it took until 2006 for one of these other social departments to hire a Mexican. Now you cannot tell me in the state of California, that is one third Mexican and Latino, that they couldn't find another one. <laughs> but apparently they could. Okay? And so, uh, so fortunately now we do have several colleagues 
um, uh, when I teach this class called Chicanas in, the, in Contemporary Society, um, for fun, I see how many Chicanas there are in the different social departments in the different ten, on the 10 campuses of the University of California. And each one has between one and two, okay? And um, most have only one. I think, I forgot who has two, but um, I don't remember who has two, but most have one, and well, UC Davis has zero. So, um, yeah, so we go from zero to uh, 1.5. So statistically, that's not good um, in, the, in, the, in the California system, where they have thousands of people. So what you do when you're the only one? What do you do when you're the only person of color in a class? What do you do when you're the only person of color in a particular social environment? What do you do when you're the only woman, or the, or the only lesbian, or the only out gay guy? What do you do, okay? You're betwixt and between different social and psychic worlds. There's an ambivalence, and Gloria Angel Duo writes brilliantly about this. Um, she was not in our book, she passed away um, in 2004, but um, I encourage you to read her book, Borderland La Frontera, because she emphasizes, you know, we can't get overly bitter about this. And so she emphasizes healing the spirit, because that's really what we need to do. And social change, that's why I go back to the whole part of this, you know, the topic of this event, changing our social world. Engaging in activism to do that can be very rewarding. It's, it can be a healing process. And I think that's part of what Gloria Anzaldu was talking about. And women have their own ways of doing this. There are articles we have on activist mothering, okay, where women use their mother's status to go claim space in the school district, to go claim space in churches, in public institutions, in welfare institutions. And this claiming of space is also part of healing the spirit but it's also part of empowerment and resistance. And these, are the, and these are the types of dynamics and social processes that sociologists who are embracing, I think, a feminist borderlands approach would, in, would, in, would undertake. So to try to end here, because I know we want to have some questions and answers and some food, I want to end with um, Gloria Anzaldu, who said something I think extremely profound. She said, I change myself, I change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Denise, and all the other presenters today. This has been a wonderful opportunity. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Okay, my mother, my grandmother, and my aunts. 
okay? We were all born in the United States, all Mexican-American. They spoke English just fine. They all finished high school, well, not my grandmother, obviously, but my, all my aunts finished high school, okay? And yet, higher education was never seen as something that they could access. My mother wanted to go to college, but it was not possible. They didn't have EOP then. They didn't have scholarships. They didn't have outreach programs. They didn't have any of these things, right? And actually, when I went to school, they didn't either. But um, I think it was, it was those types of questions that said, how is it that people who, because I didn't hurt, I've heard all my life that if you work hard, you will succeed, and you can do whatever you want, you can become president, right? And thinking, but no, for groups of women that I know, for groups of people that I know in Los Angeles, they had, every, they had the tools, but nobody showed them how to make those tools work to advance in a different way. And my mother advanced in her own way, so she retired making more money than I do, but that's a whole other story. And, um, <laughs> but um, I do think that it's important for us to remember that how these kinds of questions of social origin and how they, how, how you can move away from them or how you stay the same or how you, you lose or you lose mobility. These questions of mobility became really my inspiration. And so I have to say be my family. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Pitons, uh, I know that you kind of mentioned that you were uh, studying a whole different thing and it wasn't until later that you went into sociology. But how, I mean, how is it that you really got into sociology? I mean, because I, I started here as a liberal arts a while back and then I got into sociology and I know, I know what it was for me, but what caused that change in, in you? Um, um, well, initially, uh, for me, computer science uh, wasn't working very well for me. It was a really kind of di disconnected kind of experience when I was at Riverside. Um, I would ask for help. I'm always used to the community college experience in the sense of talking to people, you know, asking them what they're doing, um, you know, asking for help here and there. At, at the, in that context, that wasn't what's going on. Uh, at the same time, um, at that point, my sister, um, it's another family conversation, my sister was finishing up her, her BA in sociology at UC Berkeley. And um, I, things were working well, my, my, my grades were dipping, I didn't really know what to do. Um, she's been really much, a lot, a lot of my guiding light in, in academics. Um, she, she helped me fill up the pastor here at uh, Getsy. She was like my counselor throughout the whole process. Um, but at that point, I really didn't know what, what I wanted to do with that science, so she suggested, why don't you try sociology? And literally, it was that simple. I go, okay, I'll give it a try. So all of a sudden, I start taking classes in social, I'm like, hey, this is kind of, I don't want to say easy, but to me, it, it came, came more natural. I was like, oh, I'm missing something. And then I had a class on um, one of my mentors, uh, Professor uh, Miranda, who's a doctor, doctor, a JD and a PhD. Um, on a, and it was, a, it was a law and society kind of uh, lay lawyering, lawyering class in which literally it's kind of um, this kind of service kind of impact where we went to the local community, San Bernardino. And we, we were out to, to a specific location in which we were trying to help out um, at risk youth at a kind of day school where we're kind of. Um, uh, where they only go to school four hours. It was not in the traditional sense at an actual high school. It was off campus and so on and so forth. And literally, he kind of threw us out there. At first, we were complaining about it, but then we recognized, wow, we got to actually understand our science and understand what we're doing to actually talk to some of these folks and make some kind of productive change. So in a sense, I, I, I felt the sociology. Um, I was lucky enough to have, like I said, my sister kind of guiding me through that. At the same time, I started making my own connections to, as a, a Dr. Segoz mentioned, the construction of identity. Growing up Chicano, growing up uh, being a product of uh, two undocumented parents, uh, growing up with, uh, they only had a fifth or sixth grade education. So my sister and I were kind of navigating while they were, tr they were trying to keep us afloat. My sister and I were trying to make sure we do all our homework and reading. So I relied heavily on my sister. Um, I started off ESL classes and I got kicked out because I knew too much English. I'm not sure how that works out. Um, so in that sense, it was a combination of, of, of my own experiences as growing up Chicano in this, this community. This, this actually right across the street in college states. Um, it's kind of funny, I have a parking permit now, not that I still live, my parents still live right there. Um, literally, it's just, just, just the whole notion of, of the science. The, it, it's kind of like the, the science almost found me. 
And in that sense, I just took off from them. I started reading all these books, started reading about Chicano history, started reading about this, and literally kind of, it, it, things are making sense. So for me, the science makes sense in my own experiences, and that, that's why I apply when I teach, or even when I'm lecturing or doing research, is, is I use it as a tool to, to achieve not only understanding uh, behavior in the sciences, but I, I understood a lot about myself through the science. So for me, I always tell my students and folks that talk about sociology, make it your own. Because the, the more connections you have to it, the, the, the easier it is to come up here and have these conversations. The easier it is to understand these inter, you know, interconnectedness of, of looking at different spaces, structure, looking at culture. Um, a lot of these conversations, we're all here shaking our hands, because, oh yeah, I read that, I read that. <laughs> I've seen that, I understand what you're talking about. Um, so some of that is really kind of, it, it really makes sense to me. And, and even when I tell folks that are taking social classes and they're not my major, and not, not gonna stay in sociology, is find the science that fits you and, and from there move on. Uh, so I found the science, I shaped it into what I looked like or made, wanted to look like, and that's kind of what you see on the screen. So it just, it's that, having that kind of, um, that driving desire to want to, to wanna do more, and at least this as a vehicle. This is not, this is not like the end result. Uh, it's a vehicle to improving myself and, and, and literally applying these ideas like these uh, wonderful uh, panelists that kind of showed us. That's wonderful. Dr. Butler? Yeah, I wanna, anyone else? Okay, we have a here. Oh, okay. Raise your hand. Uh, for Valencia, um, why did you decide to focus on the Oaxaca community and not the other indigenous people from Mexico? Because I know there is like other groups. Is that because they're the majority here in California? Um, that's a very um, good question and a fair question. Um, I, uh, I lived in a, in a South Oxnard community of, of Oaxacans. And also, uh, during my time here at Oxford College and with the uh, Sociology Club, we volunteered with uh, MICOP, so um, uh, the Mexican Mexican Community Organizing Project, and uh, uh, which are is a is an organization that primarily helps people have in the community. And I actually uh, naively didn't know much about the Oaxaca community. I didn't know anything really. Um, in fact. A lot of the things that I know now is from, you know, uh, volunteering and working with, with uh, a lot of the folks there, um, and it was uh, it was a, a really harsh reality that, that I came to to know by working with them and knowing the, the struggles that they go through, uh, knowing the the, the 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 issues that um, exist in their community, and so I think from that point on, just being invested in that way. Um, I started off volunteering as an ESL instructor for some of the some of the women there, uh, teaching them uh, to speak English and and, and you know d just during the time that I that I had available and uh, you know it was that point on from that point on is is when I just really uh, thought that I could um, focus on that community. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I mean. I Especially in future research, if I have the opportunity, I would love to, you know, uh, look at other other uh, communities, other indigenous communities, and, and uh, look at you know what factors exist with them. And, and um, but the reason why I chose the Oaxaca communities is because I was directly invested with them initially during my time here. So, thank you. Very good question. Okay. Then was... What's next for you? <laughs> That's another good question. Uh, well, I am crossing my fingers, but um, I have applied to grad school. I have received my decision, but I'm hoping for Columbia University in New York. Hopefully. Cool. Oh. <laughs> Somebody else have questions somewhere around here? different different factors for me the most important thing was you know my family for sure 
Um, I have my mom and dad, are, they're divorced, but they're very, they're very important people in my life. And I have uh, two brothers and, and lots of nephews that I want to be a role model for. I am the oldest, so I feel like I, I have that responsibility. I have that, that, that responsibility on my shoulders of, you know, uh, my parents are also undocumented. Um, they, they came here undocumented. My dad just got a citizenship last year, I believe. Uh, and my mom is, you know, working on it, and so, you know, um, they both have an elementary education, and I think that all the hard work that they've done to, to get us through, to come to America, to, to find that dream, that American dream, um, I want to show them that it's, it's possible. And not just them, but everybody. And that's why I'm here today, to show you guys that it's, it is possible. Um, there's going to be, it's not going to be easy. And that's just reality. It's not. Um, and sometimes you'll find yourself um, in wonderful opportuni opportunities and take advantage. But there's other times where it's really going to be hard and you're going to have to find something deep in yourself to really uh, want to keep going and, re and reach that goal. Whatever that goal is, whether it's just the BA, your master's, your PhD, a JD, anything. So I think that um, having some type of motivation, having something to look forward to is very important. Um, especially because, uh, you know, Starting out, I did feel like these things could happen to me. You know, as a young Latina woman, uh, I didn't think that I could have the opportunities that I've had, and I've been very blessed, and I'm very lucky, and I, uh, I'm very humbled by everything, and um, just be motivated. And, and, and as long as you have your family and you know something good to look forward to, you work hard. Uh, I think it, it's all possible. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jean, I wanted to ask you if your research was going to be published, and if so, where can we have access to it? We just submitted, so the first paper's going to ASR, so we'll see after that. What is tell everybody who, what ASR Oh, it's American Sociological Review. So. Okay, so and one of the main journals in sociology. Thank you. I've heard a lot today about the Chicanos, okay? When I grew up in 1934, I was born in Watts, California, and they were not a big lot of Chicanos. The Chicanos lived on the other side of the tracks, and we, we lived on this side where my father had his own little business, a little cement business, there were nine of us, so anyway. But when, in 1973, I became a feminist. I found out that women were not supporting women for jobs, protecting them against sexual harassment, which we didn't even know the term support each other, stay together, women help women. You've seen the, our daughter wrote a book, Chicano Women. Anyway, not just Chicano Women, when I worked in affirmative action, we supported everybody. So women helping women, and men give women that dignity. Don't make fun because we are women, but help us all to reach that same plateau where we all be equal, okay? So anyway, I just want to thank everybody. This was a great conversation. coming and we're going to think about having this on an annual basis. So next year we'll do it again. Thank you all the folks who have members. We'll see you next year.